This is Glambition Radio, episode number 249 with Sharon Lecter, author of Exit Rich. Ladies and gentlemen. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Glambition Radio. Welcome to Glambition Radio. I am your host, Allie Brown. I'm an entrepreneur, mentor, investor, and founder of The Trust, the modern premier network for seven and eight figure women leaders. I love thinking big, doing different, and exploring ideas that disrupt the status quo, especially when it comes to women, because we are creating the new models for leadership, business success, making money, and changing the world. And hey, we're doing it with style. So let's go. Wow, get ready for a really powerful conversation. Sharon Lecter has been around a while, and these are the women I love to have on the show because there's so much wisdom they have gained from everything they have done, different deals, different arrangements, different assets they've built, wins, fails, and she's going to be sharing it with us all today. I'm having her on for two reasons right now. One is she has a new book coming out called Exit Rich, which is all about assets. And I talk often about asset-based thinking and how women need to do more of this. But there's kind of another secret reason I wanted her on. And that is uh, several years ago when she got involved first with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, she released a piece of his work that had been locked away for years. It's a book called Outwitting the Devil. And it's fascinating. It's about a supposedly fictional conversation between Napoleon Hill and the devil about all the fears that hold people back from their great work in life. And it was a few months ago that I came across the book again. I had it in my closet here in the office and was doing some reorganizing. And man, it jumped out at me. Such powerful stuff in there to help you realize, okay, what is holding us back at this time? And I see a greater conversation around that book right now and the world and fears that are being used against us to manipulate us into states of compliance and submission. And I mean, just just so many layers to this. You, you will see it from one angle or another. I promise you it will be valuable to you in, in one way or another, outwitting the devil. We're going to talk about that today. And of course, she's best known from all her books originally with Robert Kiyosaki. She is co-author of The Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that whole initial series, wrote several books with Robert and then moved on to do her own thing. And you're just going to really enjoy getting to know this woman. We've kind of crossed paths at so many events and and ventures and organizations we've been involved in. And it's great to have her back here on the show. So do not miss this. You'll want to have a notebook out for this one. Quick reminder that this show is sponsored by The Trust. It's the new private premier network for seven and eight figure women entrepreneurs. Join the trust.org. We are so excited to be in Miami. By the time this show airs, I think it'll just be a week away. We have women flying in from all over the country, just ecstatic to be together in person. Humans need to gather and have that connection. And the conversations we have there, just some of them you can't have on Zoom. You can't have online. It's just not the same. Magic happens when women leaders are together in the same space and connect. If you'd like to learn more, it's jointhetrust.org. Quick shout out to two reviews that my team pulled for me from Apple Podcasts. Five stars from Judy Holler. Hi, Judy. From the US, Allie is a light. Her episodes are powerful and purposeful. I leave inspired, smarter, and ready to take my biz to the next level. Grateful that Kara Golden told me about Allie. Thank you. And Lydia Amoa from the UK and Northern Ireland wrote, Outstanding, wise, and funny. I like that one. I began listening to Ellie's podcast in 2020. I knew of her work through an old colleague who was coached directly by her. All of her interviews are insightful, relevant, and relatable. They help both my business and my personal relationships. 
Keep up the great work. Keep inspiring as you always do. And may you remain blessed to be a blessing. I like that. I'm going to use that. Thank you, Lydia. And now get ready for a powerful conversation with Sharon Lecter. Sharon, I'd like to know where you are right now. I am sitting in my dining room, actually, in Paradise Valley, Arizona. I've seen your gorgeous home. And I want to share with everyone, it's the kind of home you come up to and you're kind of looking for the butler. Like I was <laughs> like, if there was a home with a butler, maybe you had one. I just didn't meet him. Just stunning. How long have you lived there? Well, we actually have been here for 30 years now. About 10 years ago, we kind of took it down the studs and rebuilt it. But I'm actually sitting, just on me, I'm sitting in the chair where I launched Rich Dad, the whole global series. I'm in the same flipping chair. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. So it's great to reconnect. You and I have kind of, we kind of, uh, cross paths and then go off and do some things and then reconnect and then reconnect. And I heard that you had a new book coming out. So I wanted to get you on the show. That's called Exit Rich. But there is actually another book that got me really thinking about you. And that's called Outwitting the Devil. And I'd love to talk about that today. But for those who are listening and may not be as familiar with you as I am, though, would you mind giving a little bit about your background and, you know, why Sharon Lecter is a big deal? Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Allie. I appreciate that. I've been around a long time, so I'll try and give you my Cliff Notes version. I started my career as a CPA, quickly decided I was working too long for somebody else. And so I started my entrepreneurial journey at 25 made a huge mistake going to, into a company, but that mistake would happen to allow me to meet a young man named Michael Lecter, love at first sight. We've been married 40 years. Was he your boss? No, actually. Okay. He, one of my clients invited me to go and buy a company with him, which I made the decision to do that because I said, why not? Which is kind of my lifelong philosophy. Why not do something different? Why not go the path less traveled? But we bought a company out of bankruptcy. And so it had been in some litigation. And Michael was actually the lawyer representing the other side. <laughs> I do remember a bit of a scandal. <laughs> yeah, that was all kind of a little bit of drama. But we actually met. He was in my office in my desk chair. And it was love at first sight. And that was January 11th. And we were married nine months later. And so far, it's still working. Oh, my gosh. Don't practice mode at 40 years. Sorry, I just had to, I had to interject. I remember there was a, a really a great story around that that I wanted to remember. It took me about 10 years, Allie, to train him because people will always say, well, who won the lawsuit? And now when you ask him, he says, I did in more than one way. So perfect. But it took a while to train him to say that. <laughs> I love it. But anyway, so we st I started, um, we had kids, my kids didn't like to read. And so I met the inventor of the first talking children's book. So I helped him build that into a global brand, Sight and Sound. We partnered with Disney, Warner Brothers, Sesame Street, Marvel Comics. So I learned so much in that company. I had, prior to that, I had started and sold a woman's magazine. And then we moved to Arizona back in 1991. Our oldest son went off to college in the fall of 92, and he came home in December in credit card debt. We didn't even know he had a credit card. Mm. So that was really, I was so mad at him, but I was mad at myself because I thought I had taught him about money. And that mm. was December of 92, and I dedicated the rest of my career to financial education, financial literacy. Fast forward a few years, I met Robert Kiyosaki, liked the idea of a game he wanted to produce. My background came into play in helping him make that game a reality. And in the process, um, he told me he wanted to charge $200 for it. And I said, it's kind of pricey. Maybe you should write a brochure. And that's when he asked me to be his partner. And our brochure for the board game was called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. We never expected it to be the juggernaut that it was. Mm. And that began um, 15 books we wrote together in 10 years and multiple products and organizations that came on board to help us spread this message of taking control of your own financial life around the world. 2007, we were really no longer aligned on what we wanted to do. And so I made the decision to leave. I tell everyone and I went, sometimes you have to close the door for other doors of opportunity to open. Mm -hmm. And four months later, I got a call from President Bush asking me to be on the First President's Advisory Council for Financial Literacy. I had the honor and pleasure to serve President Bush and Obama. and I wouldn't have gotten that call had I still been a rich dad. So again, my reflection back to everybody listening is, is there a door in your life you need to close? So mm -hmm. the doors of the open? And then 
months later, I got the call from the Napoleon Hill Foundation and certainly wouldn't have had that call had I still been at Rich Dad. So I've had the pleasure of working alongside the foundation with several books, Three Feet from Gold, Out Within a Double, which we're talking about, Think and Grow Rich for Women, and Success in Something Greater. And now my most recent book that you mentioned, Exit Rich, is coming out this year in alignment with Inc. Magazine. So it's been kind of a wonderful journey, and I'm still as passionate about helping people take control of their financial lives as December of 1992. And here we are. My company today is called Pay Your Family First. And I'm all about family. So what is it about finances for you that was always just such an important part of what you wanted to create in the world? That's a great question, Allie, because for a long time, I couldn't figure out why I was so weird. Um, I was raised in a very entrepreneurial family. We lived in a small house between my mom's beauty shop and my dad's car lot. We had rental properties that I go scrub out bathrooms between tenants when I was 10. And we had orange groves, one of which is now SeaWorld. So I understood from like innately the power of assets. My favorite word is assets. And I just been talking in the last couple of years about assets are sexy. And the older you get, the sexier they are. But I didn't realize until I got out into the real world that most people were chasing income. They're chasing Mm -hmm. a salary. And if you, instead of spending your time in exchange for money, invest your time in buying, building, creating assets, and those assets generate the income and they become your employees without the HR problems. And so it's so important for people to have that. And I didn't realize that 99% of the people don't understand that. And that's something that I said, we have to change. And certainly I was very upset that we're not teaching our kids about money in school, another big passion of mine. When I was on the President's Advisory Council, we were able to get the law passed that prevents credit card companies from soliciting kids on college campuses. Yeah. And that was a huge win. I can't take credit for the bill, but I certainly was a squeaky wheel. But it, you know, as you it's just imperative that we identify the sources of why we stay stuck. And a lot of that is a lack of education about money. Yeah. An observation I've made, I wonder if you agree with um the most of my work is with women, the women entrepreneurs and business owners and and the ones especially who've reached the seven and eight figure levels. And the women still don't seem to have that innate asset thinking as much as the guys do. I know it's a problem all over, but women seem to be great earners. Like you mentioned, we're great at generating income. We're great at creating businesses that generate income, but this asset based thinking, it's a new type of thinking. And do you think it's just kind of natural that it is new for us based on the timeline of women and the power that we've been kind of allowed and then, then coming into business? Or do you think there's really something that, that needs to be fixed, like we like, you know, kind of from your perspective. Well, I think we're on a, a very positive upward mobile curve that we just need to keep on. I think women, you know, ten years ago or seven years ago, we had only one point seven percent of women business owners made over a million dollars, and now that's four point two percent. It's still pathetically low. And a lot of it, I think, and certainly you're as even more of an expert than I am with working with these women, but that I think is a tremendous amount of lack of self-confidence and a lack of willing to ask themselves with the right people, investing in Mm. themselves for mentors and, and really having that confidence. There's a huge imposter syndrome with a lot of women that they feel like they're not good enough. They don't deserve it. And that's something that is almost a social moray for generations of being told we were supposed to be caretakers and nurturers. But now they're starting to see the light and they're starting to stand in their power. And certainly the tribe that you've created, huge, hugely powerful and influential to other women, setting the proper examples. And as we see in society now, it's the last time I looked at a stat, 38 percent of households in America, women are the primary breadwinner. Mm-hmm. So that's changing a lot of things. And that's something that we have to continue surrounding ourselves with people who believe in us, because that's one of the biggest issues I see. Women don't have the right people around themselves and their and their self-confidence isn't where it needs to be. So let's let's start with exit rich, if we could. Because that kind of segues nicely from what we're talking about and and looking at creating more assets instead of just being an earner. 
tell me about the idea for the book, why you thought it was time and, you know, what we should keep in mind around it. Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much for the opportunity. My co-author is the number one business broker, female business broker in the country. And she reached out to me because she, we both have the same passion. Too many, particularly women, but too many people own a job, not a business. They think they're a business owner, but they own a job because they've not taken the time to build the foundation in that, in that business. And when you build a house, you go down first to get the foundation strong, and then you go up. And then when you build a business, you really need to understand every aspect. And so in the book, we talk about how to really build your company so that you can exit rich, or you can create an asset that is an economic engine Mm. that supports you and your family for generations if you choose to. And so we go through the six P's. The first one, of course, is the people. Who do you have around you, your mentor, your advisors, your employees, to really make sure that you have a business that can be scalable? The next one, of course, is product. What is your product? What is your service? But then we talk about your processes. That's what really makes a business scalable is your business systems. And they are tremendous assets within your business that help you define your competitive advantage. They help you position yourself as a niche in your industry, and they help you scale. And then your proprietary. That's the the golden egg these days is that intangible asset, those things that you've created that came from your mind that are not on your balance sheet because you've added that intrinsic value. You think about one of the largest transportation companies, Uber, they don't own any cars. Um, Largest hospitality is Airbnb. They own no hotels. And so it's because of that intellectual property, the software, the systems that they create that Mm -hmm. add incredible valuation in their company. And then your patrons, your people. So many people out there are are, shouting from the rooftops. I have a million Instagram followers. I have this, but all the, they don't really own them. Instagram does. And so if the people listening right here do nothing else, start enticing and offering things to those people in your social media circles to come to your database. Yeah. And because your database is a huge asset. So important because when you share something on Facebook, you don't know how many people are going to see it because of Facebook's algorithms. When you send out an email, those five, 50,000 people will get your email. Now, whether they open or not, but at least you've accessed them. And so it's so important. And then the, at the end of the day, the, the sixth P is your profits. And too many people just focus on the product and the profits. And they don't take the time to build the foundational elements of the proprietary information, the business systems that allow you to be scalable. And yeah. so I want to have people take their successful companies, make them sustainable, scalable, and saleable. I think um, social media has done Uh, some great things and also a huge disservice in creating this illusion that that is business and, and, you know, gaining the followers and slapping up an offer. And because I I've seen this, I know this ain't your first rodeo either. You know, I've been around for a while too. And we've seen all these evolutions in, in how, especially people who are new to this, see how a business is done. And because that's the surface sexier thing, but I love how you say assets are sexy. And now, I think with a with a bit of business maturity, especially, you realize that this is the whole game. This is the and most of it people don't see. This is all happening behind the surface and taking the time to do this and making the investments where you should. It's it's just a different way of thinking the com- completely. But it's so exciting when you see women start to think this way, especially, it changes their whole world. I'm sure you've seen that as well. Oh, and they become trailblazers for other women. Mm-hmm. And you know, what a great example you can set for people to see that you're doing your due diligence, you're doing the homework, you're bringing in the right people to build a structure. It's so much easier to build a business that is based on systems and policies and, and than trying to build a business of personalities. Mm. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. This is like the new sexy. <laughs> Maybe it's just my business maturity now, but I'm like, that's, that's like sexy now. That's when does the book come out? Well, actually you can get it now. I have pre-release copies. It was delayed from a 
grand publication because of COVID. It's going to be out in May. Okay. You can, if you go to exitrichbook.com, exitrichbook.com forward slash buy, I will, you can get a copy right away. Okay, great. Good, good. We will. I, I try to upset the publishing industry on a regular basis, so I'm doing it again. So we've yeah. got the books available to you now. Yeah, I love it. Well, it's their fault. They, <laughs> they stopped yeah. printing and all that. <laughs> so are you okay if we move into the Outwitting book? Absolutely. Oh, because this is, and, and some of you following along be like, what, what do you talk about devil book? What, what is this thing? So let me just, let me, let me lay this out. So Many of you, of course, are familiar with Napoleon Hill and the classic Think and Grow Rich book, which I remember someone handed to me, gosh, probably 20 years ago. And, and it was so helpful in me understanding that a different way of thinking had to go along with how I was going to be doing things differently. The, the thinking behind that was such, such an important piece of that. And then... He had some, you know, subsequent books, but I didn't really pay attention to those. Hadn't really paid attention. And then I, I was aware of you. And then out comes this book that dropped just like a bomb called Outwitting the Devil. And it's Napoleon Hill's work, but you got involved with that. And I guess it had to do with the foundation. So can you backtrack a bit and talk about first how this work came out into the world and, and why was it so late to the game? Or did you just bring it mainstream? Tell us the whole story. Absolutely. It, it is quite the story. It's amazing. Napoleon Hill spent 25 years researching and talking to people and, and, and before he released Thinking Grow Rich in 1937. And that's why it's such a powerful tool, because it's not one man's philosophy. He really interviewed 500 of the richest men, of course, because there were no women in business back then. But he took it and found all those common elements between them. And that's why Thinking Grow Rich is as valid today as it was when he released it in 1937. But when he released it, he was frustrated because that even though I have, I'm the guardian of the pathway to success, even though people can read this and know what to do, they won't do it. And he even felt that he himself had not created the success he should have. And he actually added that last chapter, Six Ghosts of Fear and Thinking We're Rich. But then he also sat down and he wrote an entire manuscript called Outwitting the Devil. He wrote it in 1938. His wife worked for the Presbyterian College, and she forbid it to be published because she was afraid of the title. She was afraid she'd get fired, and it got locked away in the vault. Now, he died in 1970. She died in the 90s, but then her sister had custody of it until just a couple of years before we published it, and it was sent to the foundation. The month that I released Three Feet from Gold, which was my first book with the foundation, I got a call from Don Green asking me to look at this manuscript. It was a really spiritual event. I, he sent it to me. I went over to San Diego. I do most of my writing at the ocean. And I sat down, turned off the phone, everything else, started reading this manuscript. And it was typed manually you know, on a typewriter with his handwritten notes in it. Mm. It was as if I was communing, you know, having this conversation with him. And it was a truly spiritual experience. I read it and I said, this has to get out. Now, at the time, I didn't even really want to look at it because I was still just finished getting out of the litigation with my ex-partner. And my daughter, who's a minister, said, Mom, I need to pray over you. And I said, yes, please do. <laughs> yeah. But I read it. It really it changed my mindset on how much fear holds us back and help me understand people that are just really struggling because of the fear. And it talks about the fear of criticism, the fear of old age, the fear of loss of love, the fear of death, the fear of poverty. And, but he also takes on, I don't know if anybody would have the courage to do it today, except I did it with him. He took on every taboo, sex, politics, religion, education, our diet. He talked about things that were well before his time. In this book, he talked about the fact that he gets young children off their path, first with cigarettes, then with alcohol. And this was before cigarettes were even known to be unhealthy. Oh, that's interesting. So it's incredible work into the psyche of our minds. He talks about religion. He says, did you learn your religion through fear or faith? That's a big one for me as I was reading the book, because I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church. 
And so on Sunday, my minister, fire and brimstone, definitely mm-hmm. taught our faith, religion through fear. I was sure I was going to hell. And and then yet the youth minister in the same church was taught the, the love of Jesus, the love of God. And so it was it really hit home with me as I understood that I actually got both my religion from both directions. Mm. And the education system, he talks about every aspect of it is still pervasive today. And so it was just an incredible manuscript, Allie. And certainly I saw an opportunity because the younger generations didn't really even know who Napoleon Hill was. And the book is a little in your face. And it really has done exactly what we had hoped and bringing awareness about the importance of being in control of your own thoughts. Yeah. And what's what's interesting about it that I enjoyed, too, and I think whether I mean, it, it's it's valid for everyone, whether you are uh, a cert, any religion or any, it, it's basically about just the dark forces versus the light also the, within us. Right. Like there's so many ways to view this conversation that he was having. I just found it so spot on in that it just suddenly made it clear to me and giving me like a model to kind of think through these fears coming up like, oh, it's an opposing force. And how do I how do I understand why I'm feeling this way? And and I just like the way it was categorized. And tell me again, though, was this a literal conversation he felt he had or was he kind of channeling this or this was did he really share what it was in in the book? He says You can believe I was talking to the real devil or an imaginary one in my own head. The question is, will you derive any benefit from what I share? So it Mm. kind of leaves it it up to the reader. But there is no doubt that it will get to touch your heart and, and you will find things in there that will tie into your own fears and your own frustrations. And when you read the book in, in the very beginning, it's as part of the manuscript. The devil says, I'm going to prevent you from publishing this manuscript. That gave me goosebumps Mm. because it was hidden away for 73 years. Yeah. And then we had all kinds of things happen. The release date got typed wrong. So the books didn't, uh, they didn't embargo the books. And it was like, okay, this is, you know, we're every step of the way. And even this interview, Allie, we, have, we can share, you and I had a hard time getting connected to do this interview. Yep. It's crazy. Um, and so it's like, okay, there he is again. Though they were supposed to do this. This is intended. This is mo- supposed to make magic happen. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, you know, the power of whether we let that negativity stay in our brain. And one of the biggest lessons I learned from being involved with this project is the power of our control of our thought, because our brain can't hold negative and positive at the same time. Mm. And as part of this process, it brought it home to me so much. And the fact that I'm choosing to think negatively, and if I'm choosing to think negatively, then negative things are going to happen to me. And I grew up with the mom. She was the queen of worry. I was really a champion warrior. And it makes you sick when you get into those, I call it my own special personal rototiller. And I found a definition while I was working on this book of the word worry. To worry is to pray for what you do not want. Mm. Repeat that. To worry is to pray for what you do not want. And it was was so in alignment with, with outwitting the devil that I realized once I started catching myself, because I still worry all the time, but I catch myself and I go, okay, Sharon, instead of thinking and concentrating on what I don't want to have happen, let's reprogram and reframe my thoughts to focus on what I do want to have happen. And it's really magical. It really does. It's like putting on a different color lens and seeing life in a much better format. You know, this, this past year, and I've shared on the show before, I, I slept like I, I really had some moments where I, I generally wasn't, you know, worrier before and then would find myself just waking up just in this very sad state of the world. And, I, and I'd never had the kind of fears that I had over the past year. Could, could you give some context into current times and how we could use some of the conversations and tools in this book to like regain control of the power we do have? Great question, because it has been 
a turbulent year. A lot of people are using the word pivot. And I go, well, if you know what your purpose is, because in, in the book, Outwitting the Devil, Napoleon Hill talks about having a definiteness of purpose. And people, the devil says, you know, if somebody knows what they want, I don't mess with them. But he said only 2% of the world qualifies. So let's be part of that 2%. And if you know what you want, then you're focused, your mind is focused on a positive outcome or mm. velocity of your actions. What happens is when we, we're not focused on that, we allow our subconscious picks up all this negativity, which there's so much of it in the world right now. And, it, and our environment is such an important part of what our mental state is. And so when you're thinking about outwitting the devil or you're thinking about your life, Ask yourself, you know, what we all have issues that happen to us. And so do we learn from them or do we set ourselves up to repeat them? And learning from adversity, that definiteness of purpose. Are we in control of our thoughts? That's mastery over self. And then controlling your environment. If there are people that are pulling you down or people that are negative, just reduce the amount of time you spend with them mm -hmm. and seek out people who make you feel good, people who support you. In this last year, that's been so important. And yet it's also been difficult because of the isolation. So you have to you have to make the demonstrative action to surround yourself with people that support you and not breathe that negativity. And then. You know, how you spend your time. Are you spending your time or investing your time? And like you, Allie, this last year, there have been times when it's like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And so I tell people, don't pivot. But if you know what you want, you just have to readjust. Mm. I mean, before 2020, I was on the road 80% of the time. Now I'm in my chair 80% of the time. But I've you know been able to adapt and adjust and be able to still deliver on my purpose but just in a different manner. Yeah. And so it's important. And I don't even listen to the news anymore because of the negativity. It gets so frustrating. And so I tell people, focus. I'm sure it's not a surprise to anybody out there who knows me. I am a control freak. I like to know what's happening. I like to know where I'm going. And when it comes to the negativity in the world, you have to take a step back and say, okay, I can't control what's happening in Washington, D.C. I cannot control what's happening at the state level. I cannot control what's happening in the global economy. But I can control what's happening in my wallet. And I can control what's happening in my brain. Mm -hmm. And so when you focus on what you can control and creating the environment, particularly when you have children, because they they just they don't have the same level of maturity, and so their whole world's got turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And so it's important for us to say, how can we create an environment of coming back to what's important? I mean, I yeah. don't need half the shoes I have. Certainly, don't need half the suits I have anymore because of the new dynamics. But it's so important for us to focus on what we do have, what we can control. And, and I know you teach this as well. The successful businesses solve a problem and serve a need. We certainly have plenty of both. Yeah. And, and people need leaders right now, too. People need real leadership. And I think this book can really help with that as well. And like, get, just, there's just so much around this. And in our pre chat, you dropped a little truth bomb about page 61. Would you mind sharing a bit of that in context? Sure. Well, when all of this happened, it's like, whoa, this is such a good, important book for today. I thought it was important when we released it in 2011, but certainly what's happening right now with the pandemic in 2020, I said it just ex exploded in a good way, people finding it and reading it. But as I was going back through it for interviews and things, I found on page 61, both in the soft cover and the hard cover, it says it talks during this interrogation, the devil. He, sa he says, you know, which of these six fears are your most powerful? And the devil says the fear of death and the fear of poverty. And they go, and at some time during your life, man's life, I will combine the fear of death and poverty and bring man to his knees. Mm -hmm. I got goosebumps when I read that. And it was so, I was like, whoa, here we go again. He's, he was already, and you add 
to the fear of death, the fear of poverty, the fear of isolation. Mm -hmm. And we have the trifecta of fear that has crippled us in so many ways this year. And it just gave me goosebumps. But the book is not just the goosebumps. It actually gives you the pathway out of it by taking control of your thoughts and your actions and who you hang out with and how you, you know, I tell people, are you binge watching Netflix or are you taking this time to retool, recalibrate and be ready to refire your business? Yeah. The good thing about 2021 is that a lot of us are feeling like a new energy this year. Like, but I think, I think we've learned to shut off the news now more. We know there's so much we can control now. 2021 is about, okay, what am I, what am I about? What getting back on purpose? Like you said, the the definiteness of having a purpose, it suddenly shuts out a lot of the negativity. And I think people are ready for that. And I think it's a great year for your Exit Rich book to come out. And ladies, you know, if you're caught up on all the worrying or you have, I just find like get back on purpose. When I'm worrying about something, I just say get back on purpose. And then suddenly those fears or little things kind of go away. And if you're feeling a bit bored or stagnant or you're not sure, then you need a bigger goal. That's something to hook into, something to pull you forward, something like taking your business and deciding that, you know what, I'm going to work on now something that is scalable and even sellable. And picking up a book like Sharon's could get you thinking that way. And then suddenly, suddenly when you, when you get latched into a purpose like that, you don't get so derailed as easily, especially emotionally. That's right. It's that focus. You get focused. And focus actually provides energy. If you think about it, you get kind of get lost in what you're doing and that energy just keeps coming because your brain is on fire. You're trying, you know, you've got a goal and you're working towards it. And it's it's kind of a self, what do you call it, a rechargeable battery. Your brain is continuing to focus because you are you're in a state of contribution. And I think if nothing else, that from this year. Exactly what you just said. People are, we're getting re-energized. But, you know, the other thing I see, Allie, and it's, you know, a testament to this conversation you and I are having, I'm seeing so much more collaborative spirit, people reaching out to me, getting, you know, how can we support each other? How can we move forward? I I just think we're going to become a a kind, I hope we'll see a kinder, gentler way, but we'll also see people really refocusing on what matters most and supporting Mm -hmm. people in 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 their journeys i certainly have just i'm so thrilled with the people that are in my world and um, we're doing some incredible group mentoring and seeing people really saying okay i got it i need i need that power of association Mm -hmm. and it's such an important issue who's in your world who's in your team who's there to support you who's there to give you a hand up and support you on your journey. Yeah, tell us what you have uh, to offer these days. What's going on with you? I, I know you offer a variety of programs. I, I'd love to hear. Oh, thank you, Allie. And I would love to to highlight you and some of the things we're doing as well. I am doing a publishing retreat. Um, it's a two-day retreat in Scottsdale, the end of February. Um, I also have an, a group mentoring program. I just am finishing the first one that we did because I have my high-level one-on-one mentoring. And it's something that uh, obviously there's only so many, a limited amount of those that I can take. But we had such a request. We started a cohort with group mentoring, smaller groups, and it's just been a blast. I just love it. And we're starting another one. So information on either of those programs, you can email me, Sharon at SharonLector.com. But in addition, I have um, a lot of online programs where we've taken what we do with our high-level mentoring programs and making them available at a very affordable rate for people who are dedicated and serious about their success. And as I know, Ali, you share, you, you got to pay attention to who, there's so much noise out there, so much, so much marketing, so many programs. Make sure you do your due diligence that they. You're investing in programs that are being provided by people who have been there, done that, and Mm -hmm. truly um, are a testament to what they're teaching. Yeah. And just uh, at SharonLector.com? Yes, SharonLector.com. Perfect. And Sharon, please share, as a final note, three great pieces of advice for everyone listening. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. Well, the first one we've talked about a little bit because I want you to start living and breathing assets are sexy. Focus on buying, building, and creating assets. It's such an important thing, and it will change your life. 
when your focus changes on building, that's where wealth comes from. Wealth doesn't come from cash. It comes from assets. And so please focus. That would be the first one. Assets are sexy. And the second one is you are the CEO of your own life. And we are all where we are today because of the choices we made before today. And if we want something different out of life, all you need to do is start making different choices. And then my third one is the power of association. Every aspect of my success for my entire career has been enjoyed, promoted, and created because of the power of association, having the right people around me, having the right people align and support. Entrepreneurship can be very lonely because everybody's is looking to you for the answers. And so surround yourself with the right people, the right mentors the right advisors, it will speed your way to success. So the power of association is very, very important. Thank you, Allie. I'm going to tack on that too, in seeking out associations and groups where they don't live in fear as well, that they're leading, that they're, you know, looking at the world realistically, yes, but they're, they're thinking big, they're moving forward, they're not waiting, they're creating, because there's such great energy to support you doing that right now. So if you're feeling that right now, check out Sharon's stuff. Uh, we'd also love to come look at jointhetrust.org, which is my network. And Sharon, just thank you for being who you are. Thank you for not stopping and still being available <laughs> and not, <laughs> not being just retired at the ranch, you know, just we, I think we need these types of messages and we need to hear from women like you more than ever before. Well, Allie, thank you so much. And I am so proud of and for you, the imprint that you've made and continue to make. And it's really all of us, you know, there's, I, I have a, a Facebook group called the Play Big Movement with Sharon Lecter, and it's all about being no, an authority in your field, being number one in your field, living your legacy, because we create our legacy with every heart we touch, mm-hmm. and then creating maximum impact. And that's what we want for everybody listening to this. We want you to be number one in your field, live your legacy, and create maximum impact. Perfect. Thank you, Sharon. Take care. Thank you so much, Ali. I appreciate you. You too. Bye. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Glambition Radio. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe so you automatically get my new shows every week. Also, I'd love if you left us a review so more women like you can discover us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Pandora, and other major platforms. And I'd love to hear from you personally. Come join the conversation on social. Instagram is my happy place lately, and that's Allie Brown Official. But you can find links to my other platforms at AllieBrown.com. Glambition Radio is the elevated conversation for women leaders, and I'm honored you tuned in.